Hello, one and all. It's my view that time recurring slime, the Congress dances. And hey, remember who finally remembers that Romers had something super duper important to tell him. Something about how Tempest was gonna fall or something like that. I can't really remember. But by the time he actually has a chance to go talk to her, she has been completely engrossed in manga and is currently being served tea by Beretta. And hey, Beretta's here! Yay! And I really was hoping we get a bit more of Brett's backstory, because it definitely is an interesting story. And we got the, you know, key points to it, but still. Uh, basically, back when we first went to the Dwelling of the Spirits to find the spirits to partner up with his students so they wouldn't die, he destroyed Ramers' elemental golem, and she was very much upset by that. So in exchange for her helping the kids, Rimuru agreed to make her a new golem. And then once everything was said and done, he did so. Well, he made her like a one-foot scale model of the same golem she had before, and then tried to leave. And she was very much upset by that. I mean, she absolutely freaking loved the model golem, and she refused to give it back. But she still wanted something that could actually, you know, protect her, keep her safe, do her busy work and whatnot. So Rimuru actually carved her a new model, a new golem, out of Magisteel, and then summoned a demon to inhabit it. And if you're wondering why Rimuru can suddenly summon demons, that is also a very interesting story, because when he was first on his way to Ingrassia to meet with Shizue's students, he ended up in a party with Aaron and her team, and became a registered adventurer. <laughs> oh, I love it, I freaking love it. Though the examiner was very much suspicious of him, because... Aaron and their party are basically fraudsters. They're charlatans. Basically, they took the garbage from Tempest to the Adventures Guild and said, Hey, look, we killed this monster. We killed that monster. We killed all these monsters. You should raise our rank up to B. And it worked. Huzzah! So the examiner thought that, you know, Rimmer was the same. He was a charlatan, a fraudster. And he went hard on him, even summoning a demon to fight against him. But Rimuru took it out with absolutely no problem whatsoever. Though Rimuru had absolutely no hard feelings about this and even regrew the examiner's leg. Uh, yeah, Rimuru didn't cut off the dude's leg. He lost it, you know, a few weeks, a few months before then and was forced basically into administrative work. But he wanted to be an adventurer again. So Rimuru, you know, gave him his leg back and he was so happy about it. I mean, he was, you know, basically brought to the verge of tears because of it. And this also showed that Rimuru's high potions can regrow lost limbs, which, you know, is very, very important. And, you know, basically puts it on the same level as holy magic blessed by God herself. So, interesting. Very, very interesting. And because Rimuru watches man summon a demon, Great Sage is able to replicate the process, allowing Rimuru to summon demons basically whenever he wants. Huzzah! Though an interesting point is brought up in the manga, where Veldora and Ifrit debate about why Rimuru didn't just summon demons to possess the students and help them, you know, control their vast amounts of magicules. And there's a very good point, but demons are a bit corrupting. Basically, they were worried, Rimuru was worried, that if he actually did that, uh, the students would turn evil and the, you know, demons would trick them, manipulate them, inducing the powers to wipe out slash control all of humanity. So, yeah, probably better go with spirits, probably better go with spirits. But anyway, so then he was able to make the body for the golem and then summon a demon to possess it and named it Bretta. And I was actually rather surprised to find out that Bretta is a girl. I mean, the voice is definitely female. And we saw the body in the uh, bathhouse and it is certainly, certainly female. So yeah, Brett is a girl. I was actually rather surprised by this. I went and double checked the light novel. And apparently in light novel, it was referred to as an it. Brett was always referred to as it. It is this. It is that. Not he, she, and that doesn't make sense. Demons are basically genderless, or I guess maybe more accurate to say they're gender fluid. Demons, or at least high ranking demons, can freely change their gender as they please. So so I guess you could say Bretta took on a female appearance because the body Rimuru made for her was female. Interesting. But anyway, after he summoned and named her, she became an arch golem. And then when Rimuru evolved into a demon lord, she also evolved into a chaos golem, basically allowing her to wield both holy and demonic forces at the same time, which just makes her so overwhelmingly broken and OP. I mean, seriously, she has a magisteel body that can basically resist any damage. Her only real weakness was holy attacks, and now she's more or less immune to them. So yeah, Brett is kind of broken. She's definitely, definitely kind of broken. And then finally, after a bunch of prying and a few threats, Ramos explains that she's here because Clayman has launched a wall purchase, a feast of demons. And the light novel rumor thinks his name is some sort of massive giant spell that's gonna wipe Tempest off the face of the earth. <laughs> uh, thankfully, that's not the case. Thankfully, that's not the case. Though the Archduke's explanation isn't all that much reassuring as he explains that this is an announcement of some sort of massive giant war, something that'll change the landscape and wipe humanity off the map. 
Uh, no, that's not the case either. I mean, centuries ago, there was a wall purchase that was called, which led to a massive war, but that's usually not what happens. The Light Novel also uses this chance to talk about the Tema Wars, these big, massive conflicts that have literally changed the landscape every time they've happened, but they aren't going to be relevant for a very, very long time, so I'm not surprised the anime didn't include that. But anyway, as it turns out, Demon Lords are a pretty laid-back bunch. If you don't mess with them, you don't mess with their territory, they won't mess with you. And there's an unwritten rule among them basically saying, if you have a problem, deal with it yourself. We're not gonna, you know, be your backup. We're not gonna help you. Just deal with your own stuff. I mean, if a weakling like Gobta were to declare himself a demon lord, yeah, some of the other demon lords would probably have a problem with that, and they'd come and, you know, murder him, or at the very least, test his strength to see if he's worthy of being considered a demon lord along with the rest of them. But for the most part, they just handle things by themselves. They do their own stuff. The only stern, hard-written rule they really follow is that all demon lords must attend the wall purchase or at the very least, they need to send a representative. And apparently, no demon lord is insane enough not to attend, not to come here when they're called, which really, really says something. Just considering what overwhelming powerhouses these people are, even they aren't crazy enough not to attend one of these meetings. And the main topic of this meeting is going to be how the demon lord Carrion incited Rimuru to kill Murin so that he and Carrion could work together to kill Clayman, and then Rimuru could take his seat and declare himself a demon lord, which, you know, is just a really, really stupid lie for a bunch of reasons. Mainly, Carrion is not a plotter. He is not a schemer. If he has a problem with you, he will fight you by himself. And, you know, this just really, really ticks off the Biscuiteros because they know that's not who Carrion is. He is not a deceiver. The second big problem with this lie is that Murin is still alive! Yay! Though it's not a total lie because Clayman really does think that Rimuru killed Murin. Remember they tricked Clayman into thinking she was dead. In fact, they even clicked Yom and Grusha into thinking that she was dead, all for the sake of tricking Clayman. So, yeah, I mean, Rimuru did technically kill, I mean, actually Rimuru did kill her for about three seconds. So not a total lie, but it takes Romers a very, very long time to figure out exactly what's going on here, to figure out that Clayman's the bad guy. So it's probably better they just keep the story as simple as possible so she can actually understand it. And eventually, she's finally able to put two and two together and realize that Clayman is the bad guy. Yay! And then we get a very interesting divergence from the light novel as they go into the hot spring. I mean, in the source material, they stay in the same room for a very, very long time hashing all this out. But, you know, I get why they're doing this. They've been in the exact same spot for the last two episodes. And people are, you know, getting a little bit bored. So this is a nice change of scenery. And hey, we even got some fan service. Yay! Though I am really not sure what's going on with Romers here. I mean, I get the Dryads, you know, they love her, she's their queen, whatever, but this this looks more like torture. It's it's, it's creepy. It's kind of creepy and definitely weird. Also, very weird that Rimuru is bathing with the guys instead of the girls. I mean, Rimuru is genderless. He is a slime, and his body is actually based off of girls, based off she's ways, so it wouldn't be all that weird for him to be in the girls' bathhouse. In fact, he's been in there plenty of times in the past. And then I realized, oh, all these guys are here are super important. The King of Dorgon, the Archduke of Thalion, the representative of Blumend. All super duper important guys that Rimuru can, you know, talk business with while they're all relaxing in the hot spring. And it works. Rimuru's able to forge a deal with the Archduke of Thalion to get a highway built between Thalion and Tempest. And while Tempest actually has to do all the work to build it, they'll be able to, you know, secure it, toll it, and guard it, basically allowing them to bring in a good source of income moving forward. Plus, Thalion is full of goods you can't find anywhere else on the planet, so Tempest having access to them will definitely, definitely be a boon to their economy. And Gel isn't here in the anime, obviously, because they're in the bathhouse, but he is in the light novel because they're still in the meeting room, and he says, The work you provide is our very nourishment, the best military training ground we could ever hope for. <laughs> oh, I love you, Gel. I truly do. You just love your work. You really, really do. But anyway, then I also realized that it's probably better that Rimuru is not in the woman's bathhouse, because in the woman's bathhouse right now is Eren, and her super-duper overprotective father would probably not look too kindly on a demon lord bathing with his daughter. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. I feel like that's the kind of thing that would lead to a war. Definitely, definitely could lead to a war. And then they feast! And I really do just appreciate that everyone has their own personalized kimono here. I mean, seriously, Veldora's a freaking dragon wearing a freaking golden dragon kimono, and it just looks so amazing on him. I freaking love it. Meanwhile, Romerus has a kimono with watermelons on it, which I guess makes a certain amount of sense, but I just love the fact that they could not have possibly had a kimono in her size ready for her. They had to custom make this one while she was bathing. <laughs> oh, I love Tempest Hospitality. I freaking love Tempest Hospitality. And also, while they were bathing, Xion, um, interrogated the prisoners? That feels like the best way I can describe exactly what's going on here, and I'm just so glad the anime kept this as gruesome as Light Hell described it. 
Oh, it's terrifying. It's so, so terrifying. And I'm actually seeing a lot of people online debating whether or not these people are still alive. They are. They absolutely are. And some of you might think that it's a spoiler, but it really isn't. Because remember, his plan moving forward to make Yom king is to give these people back to Falmus. And I think Yom or Murin would have piped in and said, uh, actually, Muru, we can't do that because they're kind of sort of dead. So yeah, even in the state they're in, they are still alive. And that just makes things so, so much worse. Seriously, they are experiencing, they are feeling every bit of the sensation as they've basically been turned into meat puzzles, meat cubes. Oh, it's terrifying. It's so, so terrifying. So, yeah, I think the lesson of this episode is don't take off Xion. Or, yes, maybe more accurately, don't take off Rumuru, because there's actually a chapter in the manga where Xion says, you know, she's not actually mad about dying, but rather the fact that the king forced Rumuru to stain his pure hands with human blood. Oh, she's such a great secretary, such a great secretary, even though she is just, you know, really unbelievably bad at names. Though I do think it's interesting here, even though she couldn't remember any of their names, she remembered all the information about them, all the information they said to her, all the important stuff. So yeah, names really aren't that important in the long run. I mean, I definitely get where she's coming from with this, because, oh my god, I absolutely suck at remembering names. Seriously, there are series I've read where I could tell you characters' entire backstories, their goals, their ambitions, their hopes, their dreams, but I cannot tell you the name of a single character in the actual series. That is how bad I am with names. I'm just that bad name. Seriously, right now there's a whole list of names in front of me. Just make sure I don't forget anybody. It probably isn't helping, though, that her notebook is full of sketches of Rimuru. I mean, that's, you know, probably a little bit distracting for her. But anyway, she finds out the king was sold Tempest goods thanks to a merchant from the east, which bothers Rimuru a little bit because, you know, those goods they have, the silk and everything, you can't really buy it in all that large numbers right now. So it's very strange that a merchant from the east managed to get his hands on it. Curious, very, very curious. But anyway, the king, you know, wants to get his hands on these goods, and he's very afraid of losing out on his trade routes because Falmus' main source of income was the trade from Dwargon to the west, and now there's actually a freaking highway passing from Blumen to Tempest to Dwargon. Yeah, they're losing out a ton of money, so they decide to attack Tempest. Oh no! The as has been made very, very clear, that plan did not go all that well for them. And then we have the Archbishop, who wanted to kill an enemy of God to raise his standing in the church. But yeah, like with the king, it did not go all that well for him. It did not go all that well for him. Though it's definitely worth pointing out that Rimuru is technically not yet considered an enemy of God. The, the Holy Western Church hasn't actually made that declaration quite yet, which means there's still time to fight back. And Blumen, Dwargon, and Thalion are all, you know, on board with it. They're going to start praising Tempest. They're going to make their relationship public. They're going to tell the whole world how amazing Tempest is, all about the goods in Tempest, all about how much money you can make if you invest in Tempest, if you start going to Tempest, if you send merchants to Tempest. And the plan really isn't to win over the church. They don't think, man, if we have all these people telling everyone how great we are, the church might hear it. And they might think, you know what? Maybe we can become friends with monsters too, because that is basically a pipe dream at this point. It is not going to happen anytime soon. But the plan is basically to just make it too costly for the church to declare Tempest an enemy of God, because that would basically be an insult to every nation who has partnered, who has an agreement, who has traded with Tempest, and would make it very, very costly for the church, and would cost them a lot of goodwill. Though it can't be forgotten, the church has a lot of influence of the major religion in the West, and they can do a whole lot to punish any nation that teams up with Tempest. I mean, there's not a whole lot they can do to Dwargon and Thalion. I mean, for one thing, they're basically outside the reach of the church. They aren't even really considered part of the West. But for another thing, there's not a whole lot of believers of Luminism in either of those nations. I meant to mention this in my last video, but Luminism is kind of a racist religion. I mean, not overwhelmingly so, but there are a lot of, you know, hardcore believers in Luminism who believe that, you know, the church's goal to keep humanity safe from monsters only applies to humans, pure, pure humans, and not to demi-humans like elves and dwarves, who they consider to be basically a step above monsters. So, yeah, kind of hard for a religion like that to spread in a nation full of dwarves and elves. And plus there's the fact that Dwargon and Thalion are such overwhelmingly powerful nations that there's not a whole lot the church can actually do to hurt them. Blumen, on the other hand, though, is a very weak, very small nation, and it is a miracle it survived as long as it has. But remember to realize that Blumen is actually in a very, very good position right now because they're neighbors with Falmus who are about to start an agricultural revolution which will allow them to export a ridiculous amount of food. They have a highway connecting them to Tempest which has a bunch of unique goods and which is connected to Dwargon and Thalion which also has a bunch of unique goods, meaning that all these unique goods basically need to pass through Blumen to reach the rest of the West. And Rue's big plan is to turn Blumen 
into the world's first large-scale trading company. Basically, he wants to turn Blumen into Amazon. Basically, let's say person A wants 10,000 apricots. Well, person A goes to Blumen and says, hey, can you give me 10,000 apricots? Blumen says, yes, I can. They go to Falmouth, they get the apricots, and they deliver it to that person. Or say they want 10,000 dwarven swords. Well, the only place they can get it is Blumen. So they go to Blumen and say, hey, I need 10,000 dwarven swords. And Blumen gets it for them, basically turning them into a financial superpower that would influence beyond comprehension. So yeah, them becoming friends of Tempest was definitely, definitely a good idea, because if Emru's plan actually works out, it'll basically turn Blum and this tiny little nation into the most important, most influential nation in the West. <laughs> oh, I love it. I freaking love it. Rimmer really, really is good to his friends. He really, truly is. And then finally, we have the third prisoner, good old Ramen. And hey, that's what I've been calling him for the last couple episodes. I guess that means I'm as intelligent as Xion. Oh, that made me sad. That made me very, very sad. And Rimuru is also sad as well because, you know, he really, really misses ramen. He decides, you know what, I'm going to try and make some ramen here. And believe it or not, there's actually going to be a major, major plot point moving forward. Okay, maybe not major, but definitely has a rather significant impact on one character in particular. <laughs> oh, I'm so, so hoping they keep that scene in the anime. I guess it'd be season three, but oh, that'd be amazing. It'd be so freaking amazing to actually see that. But anyway, then as they're trying to figure out exactly who Ramen is, they also talk about Raz and everyone recognizes him like, oh, Raz, and he's been a mage for centuries. He's the wisest. He's the strongest. I wouldn't want to fight him. Agreed. I mean, he's so powerful. I had to fight him to a draw. Agreed. Agreed. He's so strong. He's so strong. And then they all realize that not only did Diablo beat Razin, but he described him as being a minnow, barely even worth noting, utterly, utterly weak and pathetic. Yeah, so uh, everyone now realizes they really, really should not tick off Diablo. Even even Rimmer realizes that he basically says that Diablo is now the third strongest in Tempest after him and Veldora. So yeah, Diablo is actually more powerful than Benny Maru, which is really, really saying something. Unfortunately for Diablo though, Rimmer was so impressed by this that he decides to send Diablo away with Yom to go make him the next king. A mission that he thinks will take years and years and years, despite the fact that Diablo really, truly wants to stay by Rimuru's side. But you know, Diablo is certainly motivated to get back as quickly as possible, so I don't think it's actually going to take him all that long to conquer Falmus. I mean, I mean, I definitely think Rimuru should be a bit more specific when he's giving orders to Diablo, because... Yeah, knowing him, I could definitely see him going to Falmus and just murdering every last person who doesn't recognize Yom as being the one true king. And then, you know, being able to get back within a few short days. I could definitely, definitely see Diablo doing that. I mean, he's certainly physically capable of doing that. Yeah, Rimuru, you gotta, gotta be a bit more specific when you talk to Diablo. And then, once again, the topic comes back to Claim and the big threat, who, as it turns out, was already giving Rimuru the middle finger, literally, sending Yamza, his middle finger soldier, to attack the Beast Nation, along with an army of 30,000. And this really confuses everyone here, because, you know, Yamza's strong. His army of 30,000, they're strong, but they can't really stand up to the Beast Kateers, so, yeah, there's no way they'd actually be able to stop Tempest, to destroy Tempest, and it takes him a very long time to figure out exactly what Claimant's planning, until Raphael realizes that the target isn't Tempest, but the refugees. Claimant's plan is to have the army murder as many refugees as possible in the hopes of turning himself into a true demon lord, which, oh my freaking god, that's an evil plan. That is a truly, truly evil plan. I mean, Rimuru did something similar to Falmus, but, you know, they were soldiers. They were coming to kill him, so it was much more justified. And there's not a whole lot anyone can do to stop Claimant at this point, because like I said, all the Biscuiteers are in Tempest, and they are too far away from Yamza, from the army, to actually stop them before they've murdered just so very, very many refugees. So that's bad. That's very, very bad. I mean, Rimuru's been able to teleport in the past, only to places he's been before, or that were within range of his magic sense. And, you know, uh, the battlefield is very, very far away, so I don't think that would actually work for him. Even if it could, I don't think he can bring, you know, an entire army with him. Maybe just the generals, you know? Uh, Benimaru, Geld, Gabiru... Uh, probably be tears as well, and basically be six versus an army of 30,000, which, oh, that'd be fun. That'd be very, very fun. But I feel like that'd just be a repeat of, you know, what we saw in the battle against Falmas, where we were just flying in the sky and murdering everyone by himself. And that was fun. That was definitely, definitely fun. But I'd rather see something a bit different this time. And next episode is called uh, Preparing for War. So I think they're actually going to find a way to bring enough soldiers to the battlefield where it's actually going to be, you know, full-blown war, not just... Rimuru and his five people slaughtering everyone in front of them. As much fun as that would be to watch. 
But let me know what you think down below. What's going to happen next? How is Rimuru going to prepare for war? How is he going to bring his army to the battlefield? Is he just going to bring his like six people, six best people to fight 30,000? <laughs> Not sure about that. Not sure about that. Uh, what about the wall purchase? The big important meeting coming up. What exactly is going to happen there? I mean, is the battle going to take place before the meeting, after the meeting? And what about Ramers? I mean, she's basically on Rimuru's side, so she can defend him at the meeting, but... Uh, not sure. I'm not really sure how great of a defense she could be. I mean, even if she says, oh, I've seen Muron, I've seen Rimuru, he's not lying, Clayman's lying. Ramers is, you know, fairly easy to trick, so I don't think her testimony would really have all that much weight to it. Oh, and hey, do you think Ramers is actually going to move to Tempest? I mean, she wants to move the Labyrinth Gate to Tempest. And Rimuru said he'd think about it, but that felt like a no. Definitely, definitely felt like a no. I guess it depends on how useful Ramers is with Wall Purchase. He's actually able to keep the other Demon Lords from basically declaring war on Rimuru. That's going to decide whether or not Rimuru decides to keep her around. I mean, she is fairly useless, more or less, but she is a very, very old Demon Lord, so she might have some clout among the other Demon Lords, might be able to convince them to, you know, either give Rimuru a chance or to make some deals with him, trade alliances, whatnot. She could have some uses, maybe, probably not. We'll see about that. But let me know what you think about all this down below. Be sure to hit that like and subscribe button, like their claimant's ugly, arrogant face. And until next time, base.